Good afternoon. I'm Lana Ulrich, in-house counsel here at the National Constitution Center, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's program. Um, before we begin, I'd like to ask that we take just a brief moment of silence on this National Day of Mourning uh, in memory of the Constitution Center's former chair and former Liberty Medal recipient, President George H.W. Bush, to reflect on his life of distinguished public service. Thank you. Uh, in 2015, we had the pleasure of hosting President Bush's biographer, John Meacham, here at the center um, for a discussion on his life and legacy. And if you missed this conversation, you can check it out on the latest episode of our podcast, Live at America's Town Hall. Uh, you can search your favorite podcast app if you have an iPhone, Apple Podcast, uh, an Android, uh, Stitcher, or another podcast app. So pl please feel free to check that out um, and uh, subscribe. Uh, today's program is presented in partnership with Vision 2020 as part of their national initiative headquartered at Drexel University here in Philadelphia, uh, Women 100, a celebration of American women. I now have the pleasure of introducing the woman behind Vision 2020 for a few brief remarks. Lynn Yakel is the president and is the founder and president of Vision 2020, the director of Drexel University College of Medicine's Institute for Women's Health and the leadership Betty A. Cohen Chair in Women's Health. She was a founder of Women's Way, the first and largest women's fundraising coalition in the nation, and she served as its CEO from 1980 until 1992 when she ran for the U.S. Senate. In 1994, she was appointed by President Bill Clinton to the position of Mid-Atlantic Regional Director for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and is the recipient of numerous awards and, and numerous honors and awards for leadership and humanitarian contributions. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Lynn Yagel. Thank you, Lana. And um, Vision 2020 has had this wonderful partnership with the National Constitution Center excuse me, for almost 10 years now. Uh, in this very space, we did a preview of our uh, decade-long campaign for women's equality in 2009, and then in 2010, we convened our first national congress here in this very auditorium uh, with delegates from all 50 states and the District of Columbia, and we launched an American conversation about women and leadership. Our focus from the very beginning has been on the year 2020 and on the centennial of uh, women's right to vote. And it's been very much focused on uh, getting, accelerating the pace of progress for women in this nation. I've been working on these issues for decades and the, we've got some great breakthroughs recently, but the pace has been pretty slow, pretty glacial. Um, Vision 2020, uh, I'm really looking forward to this presentation today because it's very much part of our three-part overarching mission, which is to honor the past, to enrich the present, and to shape the future. We really want to encourage young people to be involved in uh, not only shared leadership among women and men, but in civic engagement and um, in fixing the things that need to be fixed. Uh, the Vision 2020 National Coalition now has over 100 allied organizations all over the United States, in addition to our delegates from coast to coast. And all are working on women's po economic, political, and social equality. We have a goal of 50-50 shared leadership among women and men in business and government. Uh, economic parity, youth education, and civic engagement. More women running for office and more women voting. And that is a very encouraging uh, piece of what has gone on in 2018. Um, just a, a year to go now until the year 2020, 
and the ambitious plans that we have for Women 100, a celebration of American women, which uh, Lana mentioned. And it's a very exciting time for us. We have uh, an interactive exhibition that'll be at the Kimmel Center for the Performing Arts throughout most of the year. We have women's leadership forums, a spring breakthrough for college students, a road rally, uh, which is traveling to Seneca Falls and back, commemorating um, the women's history of suffrage. Uh, and then a toast to tenacity on August 26 on Independence Mall and our big national congress in the year 2020 in Philadelphia uh, in September. Our a big a, additional goal for that year is to have a modest 100% of eligible women voting in the 2020 elections. <laughs> uh, the <laughs> it's a great goal and it's <laughs> We want to do that to honor the suffragists and also to demonstrate that we are a majority and we can act like the majority we are. So that is a big part of our focus. Um, I invite all of you to plan now to join us for our celebration, to visit our website at drexel.edu slash vision2020, uh, to volunteer, to become a member. Uh, you're all invited. And um, we've got uh, a lot of very exciting things, uh, you know, that are in the works. So finally, I just want to say that I hadn't really given a lot of thoughts to the sequence of the 27 amendments to the U.S. Constitution, but it occurred to me recently that the 19th Amendment, enfranchising my half of the population, came after the 18th Amendment, which was prohibition. So my theory has become that once the nation sobered up, it, <laughs> it came to its senses. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Lynn, and we look forward to partnering with Vision 2020 in the future for uh, other programs like this. So today's program features two authors who have written compelling new books about the history of the fight for women's suffrage. Dawn Langenteel is the Janice and Julian Bears Assistant Professor at the Ronald O. Perlman Center for Political Science and Economics at the University of Pennsylvania. She is the co-editor of an edited volume currently in progress, Good Reasons to Run, Women and Political Candidacy. Her most recent book is Forging the Franchise, The Political Origins of the Women's Vote. Elaine Weiss is an award-winning author and journalist whose work has appeared in numerous publications, including The Atlantic, Harper's, New York Times, and Inquirer, among others. Her first book was Fruits of Victory, The Woman's Land Army in the Great War, a fascinating example of w women mobil mobilizing themselves and challenging gender roles in World War I. Her newest book is The Women's Hour, The Great Fight to Win the Vote, and is being adapted into a TV series by Steven Spielberg, Hillary Clinton, and others. Please join me in welcoming Dawn Langenteel and Elaine Weiss. Okay, well, thank, thank you both so much for being here. Um, Dawn, in your book you write about the importance of political competition and mobilization of the women's movement, which Elaine then narrates in great detail through the story of the ratification fight in Tennessee uh, through characters like Carrie Catt, Josephine Pearson, and Sue White. So uh, Dawn, can you start us off by talking a little bit about this idea about mobilization? Why was it so important to the women's suffrage fight in the United States in particular? Thank you very much. Oh, is this working? All right, thank you very much for having me and the National Constitution Center and of course to Vision 2020 and Elaine Weiss, whose book I read in detail and absolutely loved. Um, so I think that I'm a political scientist and I write about some of the strategic interactions between suffragists and politicians and try to um, think about them at a higher level of abstraction. So in my book, I discuss the fact that politicians in order to do anything, have to believe there's some advantage for them. That's like the basic nuts and bolts of politics. Uh, and in many countries around the world, women began to demand the vote in the middle of the 19th century, so after Seneca Falls, after 1848. 
And in most places, the politicians said, well, the women don't want it, and it's not clear that they would vote at all. So it didn't seem to anybody at first like it could possibly be a good idea to reform the electoral law, which, has, which takes a very long time, um, without knowing something about what was going to happen after they extended the vote to women. And there was a lot of uncertainty about women's votes. A lot of things were said. Everything was said under the sun. They were going to be commies. They were going to be um, you know, in the pockets of the priests. Everything under the sun was said about the women's vote. And so what I argue is that mobilization of women is important not only for getting this issue on the agenda uh, for many women ac around the world, but also because the things that women did when they mobilized, the types of arguments that they made, the ancillary um, causes that they fought for along the way to the vote, gave politicians an idea about what women were going to do with the ballot. So mobilization itself can change people's minds, but it also sends a signal to people in elective office about what women are going to do after they're enfranchised. And that's the key source of information that people were looking for in deciding whether or not to let women have the vote. Great. Um, so Elaine, um, in your novel, you focus on a number of characters um, who were behind this, this mobilization effort. Can you tell us a little bit about the characters that you start off with in your novel, namely Carrie Kett, Josephine Pearson, and Sue White? Who were they, and why were they so significant to this fight? Well, I'm just going to make one slight correction uh, to, to your question, which is uh, my book is not a novel. <laughs> it is, it's, it's not fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, it is nonfiction. Mm -hmm. It is history, um, 750 endnotes at the end. Mm -hmm. um, yes. <laughs> but I do write it. Uh, I, I did borrow some novelistic techniques um, so that I wanted to make this story uh, readable. And enjoyable it's because a to how <laughs> Thank readable you. it is. Yes. Um, one of one of the reasons I wrote the book was that this such an important part of our history, half of the nation being enfranchised after seven decades of bitter struggle, and no one knows it, or few know it. Um, there's wonderful scholarship done on it just amazing scholarship. But for the general reader, for the general American of all ages, there's, there's just been precious little. There's a, there's a wonderful seminal uh, book, which was A Century of Struggle, which Eleanor Flexner wrote um, more than 50 years ago. And it's great, but it's not something you would you know, stay up reading. And I wanted to make this a character-driven story. It is a political story. And Dawn, in her book, sets the, the, the parameters and the foundation, the political uh, foundation of why this had to happen. Uh, I wanted to, to humanize the story. And so when I realized, um, I came across the story in the Library of Congress by accident, which does sometimes happen. It was total serendipity. I was researching something else and came across a report that, um, uh, of a bequest that had been given to the suffrage movement, and it was how that money was spent. I was following the money. I'm a journalist by training. I was following the money, and it showed that some of the money went to the ratification effort, and in that report, it detailed what happened in the very last battle, and that happened uh, you know, to try to get the 36th state to ratify which um, there were 48 states in the union, three quarters have to uh, approve an amendment. So this was the last best chance for the suffragists for various reasons. So I wanted to tell the story, but not tell it in a dry historical way. I wanted to bring the reader along so you would understand these women and men, um, what were their motivations, what was their background, um, what personal history brought them to this moment and to their ideas about women's equality. Because the fight for suffrage, I think it's important to remember, is not just a political fight. It is very much a political fight, but it was a social and cultural, and for some, a moral struggle about the role of women in society. And that made it a precursor to what we would call now the culture wars. 
And so it had layers of emotional and, and um, uh, sort of, again, moral um, layers of meaning that made it much more passionate and volatile than just a political, yes, you can vote, no, you can't. Because this was really changing how women's role in the world, in government, and in society. And, and as we'll talk about, one of the, the fears was that women were going to demand more things. So um, I, again, found a wonderful um, piece of information, which is that these three women who represented different aspects of the struggle um, all arrived in Nashville, Tennessee at Union Station on the same night. Um, and they were summoned there to, to lead this last battle. And so Carrie Catt is the president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, the mainstream suffrage organization, claims about two million members. She's a protege of Susan B. Anthony. Um, so she, she brings the lineage, the whole history of the movement with her down to Tennessee. Um, and then Sue White is the young third generation suffragist. She's 32 years old. She's left the mainstream, thrown her fortunes with Alice Paul and the National Women's Party, the more radical, not militant, radical um, suffrage wing. And she's, she is tired of asking. No more pleading for the vote, demanding the vote. And so they're willing to, to take on new tactics and strategies and confrontational uh, aspects uh, that have never been done before, and they're thrown in prison for it. Um, so she represents that, that other strain. And then uh, Josephine Pearson, who is the president of the Tennessee Asso of Association of Women Opposed to Women's Suffrage. And this brings in the whole aspect of the anti-suffragists women and men, but I'm fascinated by the women who opposed their sisters getting the vote and what were their motivations. So I'm able to tell the story primarily through their, these three characters, but then there's a whole host of people who, who enter the fray. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah, and, and I should emphasize too, of that's course okay. this is not a book of fiction, but it, it's so <laughs> engrossing it reads like a novel, so that's why. <laughs> that's fine, that's, <laughs> that's fine. Why. <laughs> yeah. um, so um, Dawn, so Elaine's book starts off with the ratification fight in Tennessee. It's kind of the culmination of this battle to get the 19th Amendment ratified. And I'm interested in what, was, what else was happening while the Federal Amendment ratification fight was going on. You have this interesting map in your book which shows the status of voting rights for women um, sort of state by state. And it's interesting to see that the majority of states that had you know, granted women the right to vote way before this amendment was passed were, were mostly Western states. And can you talk a little bit about that, the, that map and what, what was happening in the West that you know, granted women the right to vote that, that wasn't happening out East? Absolutely. So the map is just a map of the United States, and there's many ways that you can color it. So we're familiar reading the New York Times. They'll have maps of the adoption of gay marriage or, you know, maps for, for many different things. And the map of suffrage looks in some ways the way that the map of the legalization of marijuana looks in the United States today. Um, so there's a long history, perhaps, of more progressive politics that start in some places and, and pop up in little bursts in other places. Uh, but of course, for anybody who's read any of the archives from this period, you'll be familiar with the map itself because the suffragists themselves kept these detailed and beautiful maps ever evolving that they would use both in their um, publications to people who were already suffragists as well as their propaganda when they were going out and trying to get more people to join on to the cause. And so if you can imagine the, the map of the United States as it is, there were 48 states, 45 and then 48 during this period, uh, beginning in around 1848 and until 1920. And the western states were many of the first places that gave women the vote. Um, and what was, what's been a puzzle for many of the historians is, well, the suffrage movement by all accounts was stronger in the east, and particularly in New England, right? New York, Massachusetts, um, parts of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and so historians have always looked at this and said, well, why, it must be something about the political culture of the West, um, because 
everybody who was a notable suffragist, except for Kat, who herself was from Iowa, uh, you know, was from the East. And so in my book, I talk about how we can think about the West, not only in terms of this monolithic concept of culture, uh, but also in terms of the political landscape of those territories that then became states during this battle. And just to give you an example, culture is not a great explanation for a phenomenon that took place over more than 30 years in the West, right? It wasn't like all of these states, the very first time women asked for the vote at the state, they said, oh yes, that's a great idea, well, let's put that on the books. In fact, I mean, that did happen in Wyoming, but it was a battle in Colorado, it was a huge battle in California, mm -hmm. Oregon, several five times. attempts, yeah, five, five times. times, I was gonna say three referenda. Yeah. Um, so many attempts in the West uh, prior to a string of enfranchisements at the federal level um, beginning in 1910. Let me just take one step back actually because I think that something that we may not all realize is that the states have the ability to decide who votes for all of the positions that are elected above state legislatures. Through most of this history, the Senate was indirectly elected by state legislatures, but the 17th Amendment, I think it's 1912, basically allowed for direct election. So it's our states in the US that determine whether or not you can vote at the presidential level um, and for the legislature at the national level more generally. So the state level ratification or sorry, the state level enfranchisement was full enfranchisement of women. So you had full enfranchisement of women in almost all the Western states, in Illinois, Michigan, New York, after a long protracted battle, um, prior to the 19th Amendment even getting on the docket in the, in the Senate and the House at the national level. Um, and so what I argue in my book is that what we have to think about about the West is not just this political culture, but also this tumultuous period where the party alliances aren't as solidified as they are in the East. The machine politics exist in the cities, but aren't necessarily as entrenched as everywhere else in the East. And these are places where politics are up for grabs in many ways. And so what I argue is that electoral competition, high levels of competition, leads to the kind of entrepreneurial activity of courting new voters. So in the Western states, the politicians thought, well, maybe this is a group that I can court and that I can win because I don't have a necessarily solid ethnic voting base the way Tammany Hall did in New York City. So it was a place that was in greater flux. And that flux is not just about political culture, but it's about the newness of the Western political landscape. And that, that is one key thing that is distinguishing the West from the East when we think about women's suffrage. Um, the final thing I'll say is that, you know, as a political scientist, I love thinking about new sources of data or using sources of data in a new way. And when I actually graphed over time um, membership in various suffrage organizations, uh, including NASA, the biggest, the biggest one, um, which Kat was the president of in most of this period, the West actually had heightened moments of mobilization surrounding some of these big pushes. So this received wisdom that, well, the New England movement was the strongest, that's definitely true throughout the whole history, but in fact, the West had very high levels of mobilization around referendum campaign, referendum campaign. And so in some ways, we have to revise our notion of it was all, all the movement activity was in the West, there were, was in the East, there were many big, big pushes, big campaigns, you know, you know, all kinds of marches and things like that that were also going on in the Western states at this time. It's also interesting that, uh, especially in, in those territories like Wyoming and Utah, actually Utah gives its uh, women the vote very early. Um, it was also a, a sort of immigration uh, aspect to it. They needed women. They needed women to come out. Uh, so there was that pioneering, you know, women as partners in forging the wilderness, but it was also they were trying to get women to, to move there. So there, there's a, a, a commercial aspect to it, too. So it's so interesting. So, um, but in the, so in the states like Tennessee that maybe didn't have these other factors that came into play with the, with the electoral or political competition in the West, 
they had this other strange confluence of forces like these interest groups that were, you know, it wasn't just the SUFs and the antis fighting, it was also these interest groups that were involved um, that were, that seemed to be afraid of how women would vote, that they weren't sure how they would vote. And so, um, so Elaine, can you talk a little bit about that? And that's interesting too, because in fact, there were women voting in many other states. So I'm curious as to why, you know, that, that, that fear was there, or if they could just look to other states and say, there's women vote this way, women vote that way. Right. Um, you know, the, the idea that, again, states have the rights to make the laws for, for their citizens in terms of voting. Um, and the patchwork that Don has described, this incredible map which has polka dots and the cross hatches um, and black and white, and it, it really looks like a crazy quilt. Um, and it, it uh, demonstrates the different kinds of suffrage. So there was limited suffrage too. So. Um, some states, to pacify women, they see you know, that the tide is coming, they, they're under a lot of pressure to give women some voting rights, and in some places they just give them, um, they can only vote in municipal elections. So that means they can vote for mayor, um, and maybe their city alderman or councilman, but they cannot vote for the senators, for the state representatives, for their governors, anywhere where there's patronage uh, and power involved. So there's this whole patchwork of, of who can vote and who cannot. Um, and one of the things that I found so fascinating in, in my research was that suffrage wasn't, we think of it as in a silo, it's not uh, in, uh, you know, affected by cultural or economic forces, but it very much is. And one of the interesting things I found was the corporate influence, the dark money coursing through the, the anti-suffrage movement. And the reason was you have 27 million women who would be eligible to vote under the federal amendment. And no one knew how they were going to vote. And there were corporate interests who, who saw that women might be bad for business. It was simple as that. And so the liquor industry, for instance, is very opposed to women voting because women have been um, very much active in the temperance movement. And for some women, that was a moral decision that, that drinking was, was wrong. But for most other women, it was actually a domestic violence issue. It was, uh, you know, in, in too many states, women, I mean, in all states, women had no right to uh, bring their husbands who beat them or beat their children um, to court because women did not have the right to press charges. They couldn't, women couldn't uh, serve on juries, women couldn't file civil complaints, women could not testify in their own behalf. That was some of the um, you know, inhibitions to women's rights that were going on. So when um, the liquor industry sees women are you know, promoting temperance and prohibitions in effect in 1920, they say, we don't want, okay, we have prohibition, but we don't want it enforced. And so they're willing, even in 1920, with prohibition, totally uh, the Volstead acts, you know, working their way, um, they are hoping that it won't be enforced too rigorously if they can keep women away from the polls. So they are sponsoring a lot of anti-suffrage um, uh, campaigns around the country against ratification. And it comes to a head in Tennessee where they uh, established something called the Jack Daniels Suite, <laughs> which was a speakeasy on the eighth floor of the Hermitage Hotel where all the legislators were staying. <laughs> and it dispensed liquor morning, noon, and night to anyone who would toddle up there and, um, and, and try to be convinced that they should vote against ratification. Um, and so there are these great scenes of legislators careening through the halls and having to be thrown into the showers to sober up, to go into the, into vote. The textile manufacturers are also very active in getting, uh, trying to thwart ratification of the 19th Amendment because they fear that if mothers can vote, they might want to abolish child labor. And child labor was the backbone of their industry, it was cheap. And so they're trying to keep women away. Uh, the railroad industry, again, they've bought a lot of 
uh, legislatures. Uh, they needed favors from both Congress and um, state legislatures because they'd been nationalized during World War I. They were hoping that the men they had, whose palms they had greased would vote their way and they were afraid women might not uh, reelect them. So you have these very interesting corporate interests that, that have a strong effect on whether this constitutional amendment is gonna go through. Mm -hmm. And so, and Dawn, adding to this complexity is, you know, especially in a state like Tennessee, which was considered a southern state, is the race question too. And, you know, initially the suffragists and abolitionists were aligned um, uh, around the time of Reconstruction, but when the suffragists like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton realized that the 15th Amendment was going to exclude women, there was this kind of very sad divorcing of the groups um, from their former ally, Frederick Douglass. Um, and it w they were told it's not the woman's hour, you know, at this time. Um, so how, how did the, the race issue complicate this ratification fight as well, especially in a state like Tennessee? Absolutely. Uh, the race issue has, was crucial throughout all of the American suffrage campaign. I'm going to talk about that for a second, but I just want to take one step back and actually say that it wasn't race in other countries, but it was things like that. So it was religion in France, and it was class in the UK, and in much of Latin America, it was about indigeneity. So. The US, uh, the race issue is singular in the politics here, but it's not unique in the sense of the deep kind of cleavage that that presented was also common in other countries, just the nature of the cleavage was slightly different. Um, and, and of course, the history of slavery in the US is, is singular in terms of, um, of these politics. So. As you said, Frederick Douglass and you know, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, they had been stumping all around the country for abolition, and many of the first suffragists cut their teeth working in the abolition movement, and it was um, a, a world's anti-slavery um, conference in the UK where women were told that they weren't allowed to participate as speakers up on the platform that first in many ways galvanized this issue well it, women don't have rights what the heck you know what are we what are we doing here um, so that was part of that initial that initial surge but sectional politics in the United States and conflicts of course the civil war uh, divided people within this progressive civil rights movement, um, in part because when you get to Reconstruction, there are these debates about whether or not you're going to include women on in the 15th Amendment. And various people got word that some of the Southern senators were trying to say, yes, let's put the provision for the ladies in, because we know that's going to sink these bills completely. Um, and so it's a much talked about uh, it's a much talked about um, conflict between Anthony and Stanton and Frederick Douglass when he says to them, look, I'm gonna push for this, you know, for these reconstruction amendments to just include um, black men because, you know, white women are not being strung up from trees, they're not being lynched, and when they are, you can tell me that it's the women's hour, but for now it's the Negro's hour. Um, and this is a dark moment uh, there's there's no way to get around it because on the one hand one has to agree with Douglas about the immediacy but then on the other hand they have to say but what about you know black women um, so what happens after that is uh, Stanton and Anthony become incredibly angered and it's not pretty you know if you've read their correspondence there's a book by Laura Free that looks at all of the things that happen thereafter. Um, there's no way to be proud of what happens after that. Uh, basically, they say, all right, well, screw you and the Republican Party, and we are going to just go ahead and try to court those Democrats, um, get money from them to run our periodicals, and make a whole lot of arguments about the hypocrisy of these laws um, going forward. And they, they say things and they're right in some ways about the hypocrisy that's being that's being said to them. So they're told, look, you know, 
uh, being allowed to vote is about citizenship and it's about whether you share in reason and it's about what, whether you're educated and so on. And then you get these reconstruction amendments that are supposed to apply, of course Jim Crow subverts them in the South, they're supposed to apply to basically any black man and the suffragists start going around and saying, well, you know, we're educated and uh, we're not lunatics and educated and non-educated and non-lunatic men are, and lunatic men, sorry, are allowed to have the vote. And the propaganda becomes very ugly. Uh, there's lots of postcards that you can look at, and there's basically no way, no way to get around to get around this fact. Um, and they're willing, essentially, to make bedfellows to get their to get their thing the thing won. Um, and one thing that I found very interesting, and something that I knew about about Carrie Cat, I knew that she had been a big pacifist. One thing I found very interesting was this idea that, well, in the final instance, too, the suffragists were, were not, um, they, were, they, they tiptoed around this race issue among the Tennessean suffs. They didn't want to highlight the fact that, you know, black women were engaged in this cause and, and, that, and they wanted to keep these issues separately. But in many ways, similar sort of hypocrisies came to the fore with the alliances that Carrie Catt formed during the First World War. Um, with Wilson and, and the war effort for somebody who'd been like a longtime pacifist. So the dark history is, is there throughout. Yeah, the racism issue was something that, how pervasive, how important, how um, disruptive it is to the movement um, was really a surprise to me and, and continues to the last moments and, and beyond, of course, beyond 1920. Um, but I think the thing to, to remember is this, the, the suffragists and the abolitionists are siblings, you know, up through Reconstruction, and then they're told that the nation cannot handle two big reforms at once, and women will have to vote. That's where the title of my book comes from, The Woman's Hour Will Have to Wait. And um, they are angry. They are just angry. They have worked for abolition and for emancipation and for uh, the 13th Amendment. And, and so they're very angry. And you can understand this. You, again, never make excuses for the vile language that are used. Um, but you also have Sojourner Truth saying, how can you give black men the vote and not black women? So this race issue, which continues uh, to rile the movement. But one thing to remember is the 19th Amendment is totally race neutral. It does give the vote to all women in every state in every election. And it's the way it was then interpreted by Jim Crow laws that made it racist. It is not the amendment, it's the way the men in the legislatures of, of mostly southern states, but some northern states, uh, denied women the vote even as they denied black men the vote. The, the idea of making moral compromises for political success, I think, is one of the themes of my book. And it's, you know, we don't like to think about that, um, but I think it's, it's really important to realize that Frederick Douglass, who's really truly one of the heroes of my book, I think, uh, he's a universal suffragist. He sticks with the, the idea of women's right to vote to the very end, through thick and thin, and it does get ugly. Uh, his, his friendship with uh, both Stanton and uh, Anthony resumes because he's making a political, a very important and vital political choice saying I have to win freedom for my people and this is my, my role. And, um, and then the suffragists do the same thing. And so when it comes down to the federal amendment, which is controversial, uh, in ways that state, state changes are not, because it also brings Washington into the picture, brings states' rights into the picture. A lot of um, the, the um, opposition to the federal amendment, we will then hear 50 years later in the civil rights movement. States' rights, um, you know, Washington overlooking election, well, we're hearing it right now, overlooking election um, behavior be, of, of the states. And so you have someone like Carrie Catt, who is such a fascinating character. She's also head of the International Women's Suffrage Association, so she knows what's going around the country. And when it comes down to winning the vote for all women, which is what the 19th Amendment says, they are willing 
to, they realize they're going to have to get Southern senators and congressmen uh, in the House of Representatives, both of them, on the side of approving the amendment. The amendment had been sitting in Congress for 40 years. It had been voted down 28 times. How are you gonna get it out of there? And so they make, and even Susan B. Anthony makes the argument, look, there are more black, more white women than black women. Don't worry. White supremacy is not gonna be rocked. Um, they also you know, say, look, you know, I know some states don't allow black men to vote. Maybe they won't allow black women. They use terrible, terrible arguments. But they know that they have to placate these Southern uh, legislators, and then they have to go to each Southern legislature uh, to get this passed. And so they do make these arguments that make us wince. Um, ho and, and you know, I think someone like Harry Catt really does hope that, in the end, give the vote to all women and hope against hope that maybe all women will be able to vote. Uh, but she also, makes the compromise, she is a pacifist, but she says, for the movement's sake, it's better for us to support World War I uh, and, and make ourselves seem like we are the patriots we are. And so she goes against her own very personal beliefs in pacifism to support and to, to give the support of the suffrage organization. Uh, Alice Paul refuses to do that. Um, and to make amends, Carrie Catt, devotes the rest of her life to pacifistic causes. Clearly, this, this was a great uh, um, compromise and, and moral uh, uh, you know, decision for her. And it's very, very, I think, very telling that she's willing to do this because she thinks it'll be good for the cause. So that's something we have to realize as you know, we talk about intersectionality, um, these women had, as, a political, as political animals had to make these kind of decisions. They also don't support publicly um, Margaret Sanger and birth control, which what could be more important for women taking charge of their, their lives? And yet it is, it's illegal and it's controversial and they say we can't take on that baggage right now. So it's very interesting what choices they decide to make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought it was so powerful how you wrote in your book and said a lot about Frederick Douglass's character that despite everything they had said and done, you know, against the, the movement for black men's suffrage, that he still remained friends with them. And I think he even still had a portrait of yes. them in his study. And, yes. and so even after he passed away, I think it was... Um, Susan Kate, Anthony's, yeah. Yes, yeah. And, and so I think that that just said a lot about him. And, yeah, uh, yeah his, he calls himself a, a woman's rights man all of his life. It's very touching. Um, another thing that was interesting that you wrote about in your book, this was prior to um, when, they, when the suffragists sort of drilled down on the 19th Amendment, was Susan Anthony's efforts early on to A, vote illegally, where she would just show up and vote, and get, she would get arrested. And then she, she tried to make an argument under actually one of the Reconstruction Amendments, the 14th Amendment, mm -hmm. that the Privileges or Immunities Clause guaranteed women right to vote. And right. although her case wasn't heard by the Supreme Court, a similar case was. Right. And I just thought that was a really unique argument to try to make. Um, do, you, do you have anything else to add to about what the court, why they decided not to rule on that issue or what they right. decided? So, so um, in 1872, um, and, and, and a few years previous to that, um, the, the suffragists realized that um, the 14th Amendment, which they opposed, uh, or some of them opposed, there is a split in the movement there too, um, uh, has this privileges and, and immunities that all citizens um, you know, should possess, and women are citizens, so they should possess these, and one of them being the right to vote. And it's called the New Departure. It's sort of a, a political science legal interpretation. It's a very uh, ambitious legal interpretation of the, of the amendment. And so they say, okay, let's try it. And so Susan Anthony gets together her sisters and some of her friends in Rochester. And this is actually a national movement. Sojourner Truth tries to vote in the 1872 um, presidential election. She's in, in uh, Michigan, I think, at this point. Um, and about 150 other women. And there had been other attempts in like 1870 in New Jersey. And, and women are trying to say, they're really uh, provoking a test case. Uh, and so they 
um, Susan Anthony goes to uh, the Rochester polling place and they march in and um, she votes and she convinces the the uh, registrars that she's entitled to this and, and she's a very famous person in town very beloved and they kind of go oh, oh okay and um, of course then it goes up to the powers that be and she is arrested and she is tried and I, I go into detail about her trial which is a total uh, sham uh, she's not allowed to testify she's not allowed to the, the, the judge pronounces her guilty without listening to the testimony. And then she goes around the country, um, or actually around the state, uh, giving lectures entitled, is it a crime for a US citizen to vote? Which of course, we're still asking that question. Um, but she then um, uh, wants to be imprisoned. She really wants to be imprisoned so she can provoke a test case to the Supreme Court. And the judge knows that he does not want, not want her to, able to do that. So he, he does not imprison her. He in, imposes a fine. She refuses to pay it. He never tries to collect it. Meanwhile, there's another woman in, in uh, Missouri named Virginia Minor, whose husband's a lawyer. And she also tries to vote. And she does successfully. Of course, she can't bring a suit. So her husband brings suit on her behalf. And this does go to the Supreme Court. And it does get turned down saying that no, women are, um, states can make a special class of non-voting citizens. And they interpret women as being non-voting citizens. That law, which is I think Hap, uh, Minor versus Happerstadt, uh, becomes the basis of some of the more egregious um, state laws banning African Americans from voting, uh, you know, you could take a class of your citizens and say they can't vote. And so it's a really pernicious decision um, that I think takes a long, long time uh, for its effects to be dissipated. Yeah. So, so they tried through the courts. <laughs> right. They, they tried at the through states. Through the states. And, they were, and it was working, but it was slow going. And so they, you know, decided, I think, uh, Carrie Cat focused on the federal amendment and on all efforts then drilled on that, which brings us to Tennessee, which is where the ratification fight culminated. And um, what I think was really interesting to read about was just this, the, just the grittiness of the fight at the state level, the local politics, the, the special interests, the different groups, you know, women against, women for, and just like, physically keep keeping the men in their hotel room so they wouldn't go home so that they could stay around for the special session. I mean, it was just really, really um, compelling to read about like how, mu how much effort it took just to get this amendment ratified. And um, so I don't know, Dawn, if you have any, have any thoughts or reactions to, um, you know, what was the effect of doing this via constitutional amendment rather than, let's say, the Supreme Court, if they had ruled in, in that case, um, having, it be, having it come down as a court decision? Was there any special effect across the country um, that, you know, caused, um, you know, maybe some states to accept it more or accept it less? I mean, I'm just curious about the, the method of the change as a constitutional amendment versus other methods of enacting that same change. Okay, so the constitutional amendment does not actually guarantee women the right to vote, but it says that insofar as states confer voting rights, they cannot exclude people on the basis of sex. That's very similar to the language of the 15th Amendment, um, which basically says insofar as states confer the right to vote, they can't exclude people on the basis of race. Uh, the reason why you have to have that kind of language is because there is nothing in the Constitution that says that citizens have the right to vote, which is what Miners v. Habersnet um, basically confirmed. Women are citizens, but the Constitution does not guarantee the right to vote to citizens. Uh, so in some ways, you, the only reason why you needed a federal amendment is to guarantee it in all of the states in the South that we're never going to give women voting rights, or at least that was the perception, and that have not to this day ratified <laughs> the 19th Amendment. Uh, something like 12, 12 or 14 states have not presently ratified the 19th Amendment. Well, no, actually they have. Some of them went after, but some of them never did. Um, I think they all have. My state of Maryland in 1958, and um, Mississippi in 1984. I think that may have been the last. Oh, I think so the, I it's incorrect. the 13th Amendment that some have not. 
I'm, I'm encouraged. I will go check. Yes. Oh, one, one interesting thing to note, though, um, so most of the countries in the world gave voting rights gradually to propertied men and then to, you know, to lower levels of property. Or if there was just an income requirement, people became enfranchised as development pursued in the 19th century. But there were some states and some local governments around the world where women actually did have the right to vote prior to the sort of emergence of democracy on the world stage. There were a couple of states in the US, New Jersey, Massachusetts, where propertied women or widows were exercised the ballot in the late 18th century. That's and then the word right. male was written into <laughs> yeah, right. constitutions at the state level. Uh, this is also the case for present day Quebec, which when it was lower Canada, had many women with property had the right to vote. And then women in Quebec at the province level had to wait until 1940 to vote. So around the world, you see this almost interesting uh, hypocrisy might not be the right word, but contradiction, where the transition to democracy for men actually brought the, the disenfranchisement of women who were from the upper classes. And so the whole course of the late 19th and early 20th century is actually like regaining rights for, for some women and then expanding, expanding those rights. Um, you know, farther afield. And this tactic of trying to vote prior to being allowed to vote was utilized in, in many countries too. So in Argentina, in Brazil, in, uh, in, uh, in France, and in England, women who were suffragists did the same thing. And this issue of whether or not women were citizens and whether citizens had voting rights was adjudicated in many countries around the world. So it's a, it's a common history, in fact, um, but one that is made more difficult in the United States. That kind of ruling is made more difficult in the US precisely because of the federal system where we say that the states have the right to determine who votes at the federal and the state level, which is different than some of the other uh, federal states in the world. So in Canada, for example, the provinces have the right to decide who votes in provincial elections, similar to Switzerland for the cantons, but it's the federal government that decides if you vote in the federal elections. Yeah. So you have many countries around the world where women could vote at higher levels and not at lower levels, which is sort of also the case with this presidential loophole in the US. Um, but I guess the thing is, you know, it's, it's complicated. Yeah. Um, and so do you need a federal amendment? Well, the suffragists all wanted it because that's a powerful symbol and suggests something that can't be taken away. Yes, right. Only one amendment was ever repealed. That's, of course, the 18th with prohibition. Inshallah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so, it, so you need it in part because there are a bunch of southern states that the women are convinced they're never going to win through the state route. But, the, but, but going for a federal amendment, which, um, again, both Carrie Catt decides, I mean, they always were, were trying, since, since it's, it was introduced in 1878, um, they're trying for the federal amendment. And Carrie Catt says, let's do both. We need to do... And, and again, this is the same strategy that will be used in marriage equality and in a lot of civil rights um, uh, struggles that will follow in the 20th and 21st century. Get states, pivotal states, to accept this. And that puts pressure on Congress or on the courts. And so that's, they, they have this twofold, it's called the winning plan, it's this, like a double track. Uh, we'll get some states that will put pressure on Congress. Alice Paul says, no, just the federal amendment, you know, forget the states, we're just gonna go there. And so, so you have these two strategies uh, for the last four or five years of the struggle, working parallel and sometimes jumping on each other's toes. But the federal amendment brings its own difficulties. Um, one of them being, again, the southern states see this as an imposition of reconstruction laws again. And a lot of, uh, the um, racist literature you see emerge in Tennessee in this last fight has to do with, do you want to open up this can of worms? Uh, you know, if, if we allow Washington to oversee who gets the vote in our state, well, they'll start looking whether we are um, up, uh, upholding the 14th and 15th amendments, uh, allowing black men to vote, and you know we're not. And so are you, willing a vote for the 19th amendment, a federal amendment is going to bring Washington to oversee uh, the, the 14th and 15th. And there, there are enforcement clauses that would have allowed 
um, supposedly Congress to rep to to uh, um, reduce the representation of those states that inhibited voting to their citizens. So they were really afraid of a federal amendment. And there's this really interesting part where there are suffragists, Southern suffragists, who had been working for this all of their lives, who then switch over to the anti side because they will not accept a federal amendment. They'll take it from their state. They very much want to vote, but because it's a federal amendment, they go and work for the anti suffragists and they all confront each other in Nashville. Um, so we have some great audience questions that I want to get to great. too, but so we don't leave the audience hanging. Spoiler alert, it was ratified. <laughs> right. They won in Tennessee. And uh, I just want to say in Elaine's book, the scene that she writes about the ratification debate, it was like it was made for a movie. So I can see why Steven Spielberg <laughs> is interested in making this a TV show. It comes down to one vote and he pulls out a letter from his mother who, who says, you know, do the right thing. Um, and so it's just a really amazing story. Um, and it, after it was ratified, that the fight still wasn't over, of oh, course. Uh, if I goes on yeah um, but but they, they were successful so um, yeah it's a, it's a it's a terrific story um, oh so okay so the first um, audience question asks um, and Don I'll pose it to you and Elaine you can feel free to answer as well um, why was the ERA amendment a failure given the success of the 19th mm -hmm. amendment <laughs> <laughs> many books about that wow. um, there's an old argument about you know, intra-feminist schisms, whether we want equality straight and simple or whether we want an understanding that women are different, maybe biologically, some people think psychologically. Um, and so whether we need to take into account those differences when we're thinking about how to form laws and policies that affect uh, women's, women's rights. And this argument was key to the suffrage debates and inter-suffrage -suff schisms, but also to the very idea that was underpinning the ERA. So a lot of women had been working to get special provisions for mothers to say that they could have reduced factory hours and not be allowed to work 14-hour shifts, which if you are a pregnant or lactating woman, seems like that would be a daunting thing to do. Um, but then you had a lot of other women that thought that's going to be the death of our, of our cause and our equality if we're treated in a special way. And so I think one of the reasons, one of the big reasons why we lost the ERA is because it's not clear that even among people that consider themselves feminists, um, that that would be, that that would have been a great a great thing. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Um, so the ERA uh, is written by Alice Paul and Sue White, who both appear in my book, and Crystal Eastman. All of these women now have law degrees in 1923. And they s see, and very correctly, that suffrage is the first part of gaining equal rights. And now it's time to move on to the other um, rights that are needed, and those are economic, rights, remember women could not get credit even in the 1970s under their own name. It's educational rights. It is um, uh, the laws of states, many of which um, uh, handicap women's progress. And they say, okay, now it's time to have equality in all these other, other sectors of our lives. And that's why they draft the, the, the ERA. And it's introduced in 1923, but um, Carrie Catt is against it. Uh, again, for these ideas that the progressive movement has worked so hard for so many years to get certain protections for women uh, in industry and in, in other areas. And that would be put in jeopardy, uh, they, they feel. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt is against it all her life. So it's not so simple. It's, it's not this idea that all women said, okay, now we're doing the ARA. It was, it, was, it, was, uh, it was controversial from the beginning. Um, and it's, you know, it's interesting now to see it coming up again. Um, I think it's a reminder after 95 years that um, federal amendments, constitutional amendments can get very close and not be ratified. That's what we were facing in 1920 with the 19th Amendment. It really could have failed. Um, and the ERA has just not gotten to that threshold. There's, there's movements now to extend the deadline, you know, to get the, the states ratified. But it is still 
uh, controversial among feminists, even though um, you know, it, it does seem like it would be a, a good thing to do. It is not without uh, some controversy. Uh, please, compare, please compare the percentage of women who register to vote versus men and the percentage of women who cast their vote versus men. And are today's women capitalizing on the efforts of the suffrage movement? Oh, great. <laughs> so currently, women are the largest uh, group in the electorate and they vote at higher rates than men. This is this just started happening like 10 years ago. Um, white women are the largest group of women in the electorate. Black women are the second largest but a much smaller number overall. Black women in the past two elections have surpassed white women in their turnout rates but it's a small group uh, and for some reason Latinas and Latinos actually vote at very low rates, um, and Latina women vote at slightly lower rates than, than Latina men. Uh, the question, you know, have we, have we lived up to, to all that has been, uh, uh, not granted, but fought for for us? Um, I, can't, I can't really answer that. I think that it's really difficult to think about, um, to, to be able to mobilize people when there's not a really big target to shoot at. And what suffrage did was take a whole host of issues that women all over the United States and the world were fighting for and condense them into a single kind of movement with a particular mission. And when you're a single, when you become a single issue uh, movement, once that's won, it can be hard to maybe solidify those gains and get the League of Women Voters to uh, coordinate women's votes as a block, et cetera. So, you know, the thing that we have struggled with in the past 15 years or 20 years is without an obvious single issue, how do you, how do you mobilize, how do you circle the wagons, how do you get everybody to, uh, to march in the streets and to get people to support um, financially your cause. So I think that uh, there's a reason why we have waves of mobilization for all social movements and that's no different for the women's movement. And the question is right now, you know, what's the target to shoot at? And if you're not, if there isn't a clear target, things seem like they're okay. If you're gonna get a lady president for the first time, everybody's like, eh, things are okay, I can stay home and just give a check or something like that. But every once in a while, you have a rude awakening, water is thrown on your head, and all of a sudden, you think to yourself, hey, you've got a target, now how can we find a way to shoot? <laughs> so, in 1920, the 19th Amendment is passed, um, enters the Constitution on August 26th, and there's only 10 weeks until the presidential election. And so there's very little time to mobilize. Um, and in some states like Georgia, they actually refuse to allow women to register. So there's a patchwork of, of registration, but only one, probably one in three women who's eligible votes in 1920. And so the press asks Carrie Catt, you fought so hard, what happened? And she says, you know, voting is a learned behavior. And women have not learned to vote yet. And that will come. And it's true that in, in many of the communities, it was legal to vote, but your family might not approve of it, your husband, your pastor, uh, your ladies club. There was a lot of um, uh, still social a resistance to the idea of women exercising equal rights. But it takes another 40 years until women's participation begins to equal men's in the 1960s, and it's not till the 1980s that it be, the percentage begins to overtake men. So it takes a long time. Um, and I think you, you can say that, uh, you know, maybe we did not live up to it, um, you know, uh, for a long time. And the other part of that equation is the suffragists were both promising and threatening a woman's vote, a woman's block of votes. So they could go to congressmen and say, and to, to presidents and say, if you don't support the 19th Amendment, we are going to come after you when we have the vote. That never materializes. There is never a woman's block of vote. And so soon the politicians in the 1920s kind of figured this out, bless you, and they are, they are no longer responsive 
to women's lobbying the way they were when they thought there might be this block of women who will vote. So it's very interesting in talking about mobilizing the suffrage movement because it was this big umbrella with women from both parties, from all parts of the country, with all kinds of different sectional and, um, and political ideas who are under this big tent. And then it folds and they all go their separate ways. And it's actually the anti-suffragists who are more focused and go on and, and keep it up and fight the suffragists in other battles. Um, and they become the anti-communist, part of the anti-communist movement. Um, and they you know, accuse Carrie Catt of being a communist. Um, they, they go on into the McCarthy era. We see them, Phyllis Schlafly comes out of this movement of very you know, um, trained conservative women who are uh, you know, have certain issues, and whether that's fluoridation in the water, um, whether it's, you know, uh, the ERA, they are, and, and we see parts, you know, we, we see that legacy right now. So it's very interesting, the suffragists dissipate into their own causes, uh, and the anti-suffragists who have learned to mobilize uh, to, to fight the 19th Amendment and to fight suffrage in the states actually become stronger. Interesting. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time, but I wanted to thank, uh, please join me in thanking uh, Dawn and Elaine for joining you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, books are available for purchase, and authors are available to sign books as well after the program. So thank you. Thank you.